comfy. Hello, welcome back. Or welcome, because this is probably your first time here. If you don't know, my name is Kieran Gill and I like to read. That's that. Today, we're gonna talk about Outline by Rachel Cust. Since I've been on booktube, I have, at least the people that I follow, a lot of people seem to be talking about this book. Rebecca Eats Books is a big fan of Outline. She recently had her husband read it and I just finished it. <laughs> and I've got some thoughts. So stick around and let's dive into it. I also want to say that originally I had the idea to do something a bit more moody. That was my thought, but I wasn't sure that I would be able to execute on it. So this is the video. It's a sit down, chit chat kind of situation. I don't really know a lot about Rachel Cusk. What I do know, she's a prolific author, she's been divorced, and Outline is the first in a trilogy. That's that. In order to go through this discussion, there probably will be some spoilers or reveals, but I wouldn't let that deter you from continuing to watch this video or to pick up the book because ultimately, the act of reading this is an experience. Because it is so devoid of plot, you can know these facts and still continue to read it. So that's a disclaimer. I don't really know how to get into this, but let me give it a try. Basically, this novel is very... To call it a novel, I think, is even wrong. It's not, a, it's not really a novel. It's almost a long-form essay that is fixated on the idea of marriage, children, writing, and intimacy. Those are the themes that are touched upon in this book. Reading this, it's, it's very fluid. There's a dreamlike quality to the writing because we are so removed from everything and especially we're so removed from our unnamed narrator that we just move from scene to scene very effortlessly and it's a very interesting reading experience it's a quick read there isn't much of a plot to this book it feels more like a long form essay where we're touching upon themes of marriage what it is what it isn't children the relationship between a parent and a child and the effects of the effect children can have on a woman's creativity, writing, the craft, summing up, uh, which is touched upon towards the end of the novel, and then also intimacy and I think identity, how what you tell and what you don't tell creates the outline of who you are. So in this book, we are introduced to a woman who is either we don't know a lot about her. She really doesn't reveal facts about herself, but it's through the anecdotes that we're able to pick up information. So she may have or is in the process of getting a divorce and she's going to Athens from London in order to teach a writing course. During her plane ride, she sits across to this man who's been through three divorces and they get to talking and she finds out more about him. She doesn't relay dialogue very often. This is a book where thankfully there are quotation marks. I'm a big proponent of quotation marks. Um, but for the most part, she will kind of say, my neighbor said this, da 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 And it's a, it's, it's a long paragraph of prose where she is just relaying the information that comes to her. They talk primarily about his marriages. We don't find out a lot about her. And then the second chapter the narrator meets an old friend who's also been divorced who sold his publishing company and they talk about writing they talk about marriage they talk about her marriage yes there's a lot of talk about marriage and as someone who is neither married 
and without children. I don't know. I, I feel like this book should be read by people who uh, are about to get married, currently married, or divorced. I think it would be more poignant for people who are in those situations. Um, not to say that it's not a beautiful book that leaves you with thoughts and ideas. And there are things that are touched upon that if you have not been married or haven't had children that you could relate to. But for the most part, this is a book, this should have been called like marriage. If you liked a marriage story, you will like this. That's what I have to say. Now I'm gonna to go to my notes. I did write notes. Um, I had, let me just show you my notes or how I take notes. I normally use an index card, but I used a white sheet of paper and I will kind of write what the themes are and primarily like page numbers and um, interesting things that stood out to me. For the most, the language is lovely. I cannot repeat that enough. She puts together such like amazing imagery, how she chooses to describe things just really, it's incredible. One of the things that really stood out to me, one passage that I really liked, mostly because I really like mussels, is this one. There was a carafe of pale yellow lime, a dish of tiny green olives on their stalks that looked bitter but tasted sweet and delicious, and a plate of cold, delicate mussels in their black shells. She just has a way with words. That's why she's a writer. Um, and another section on page 91, she's describing street children who are riding bikes under bile colored street lamps. Like, so interesting. Through this theme of marriage, we are introduced to her friends and acquaintances and strangers who, if not married, are in a relationship and, or have been divorced. I would say that most of the characters in this book have been divorced. I think you could say that her thesis is almost that in order for a marriage to survive or for there to be a successful marriage, the couple needs to have a shared vision. And it is through that shared vision that they can build and create and live successfully, whatever that may be. But once that shared vision has been shattered or one person chooses to step away from it, there's no going back. You need both people to fully devote and connect. On page 80, 81, she goes further to elucidate this little um, idea that she's been crafting by describing this guy is describing, or this woman, I don't remember. Someone is describing their children and how siblings even do the same thing. These, her, I think the women's children, two boys, created an, an, an imaginary world where both people had to be, both of these children had to be equally invested in order for them to play. And then at one point, an argument occurs between the two brothers which causes or results in the disillusionment of this vision. So how she describes it on page 80, 81. In other words, it was nobody's fault, but all the same, it was brought home to me how much of what was beautiful in their lives was a result of a shared vision of things that strictly speaking could not have been said to exist. And why that strikes me or why I see that like parallel is because even in these relationships, vision itself also isn't real. It's only made real by the individual's decision to jump into it. And then on page 45, we have the narrator is meeting an old friend who's a writer and he's describing, he was able to write a successful series of short stories and since then has failed at writing and he's okay with that. But he kind of describes how the only way he was able to do that was because of who he was at that time and place. So he no longer recognizes himself in those stories. And then he goes on to say, I suppose it's a bit like marriage, he said. You build a whole structure on a period of intensity that's never repeated. And how I read that was, oh, I feel like I'm in class. Um, how I read that was essentially the people who decide to get into a marriage 
the real like intensity of their love is what causes them to commit but that the intensity of their emotions will change and evolve such that it will never be repeated on one hand you have her creating building examples of couples who recognize that in order for their marriage to have succeeded or to have succeeded as far or as long as it did was a result of two people coming together to um, honor a shared vision. That is on one hand. On the other hand, you have her discussing how by being in this partnership, you start to see yourself through the reflection of who the other is or isn't. That you are so, uh, I'm gonna use the word codependent, but that's not the right word. Um, you're just so enmeshed with this other person that they become a part of your identity. On page 105, I replied that I wasn't sure it was possible in marriage to know what you actually were or indeed to separate what you were from what you had become through other people. She then goes on to say how she thinks that the idea of the real self might be imagined. From there on page 105, I think she then like wraps up that idea on the very last page of the novel, uh, or not the last page, like the last five to 10 pages where we meet another woman who has been divorced and was recently mugged. And this woman describes how after she was mugged, she loses a lot of weight, but also at the same time has some like disordered eating and like can't stop herself from eating once she starts. But she kind of says something about how she met with her husband, her former husband, and he was describing himself, but through that description, she recognized who she was not. And then she goes on to say, in her life as a woman, she had been amorphous, a changing shape for whom her husband had been the mirror. But these days, since they're divorced, she found herself without that reflection and an inability to even know who she was. So there's that thought. So essentially with marriage, we have the idea of the shared vision and then building your identity on the other person. The third interesting marriage idea that I found upon reading this was in two of the anecdotes that are relayed to the narrator. The first one occurs a lot similarly, um, a lot earlier in the novel. She meets with her guy friend who describes a situation where him and his wife had recently separated and he went on a trip with his two young children at the time and they go on a bit of a car ride a road trip rather and there's a horrible rainstorm they get stuck in this bad hotel the children have all these mosquito bites he wants to leave the hotel room so they get back in the car and they're driving and driving through the rain and it's treacherous it's stressful it's horrible they stop at this inn um where there's a bunch of girl scouts who are singing french songs something like that and he calls up his wife his ex-wife he tells her the situation and he's met with silence and then she says something like very um offhanded casual like oh you'll figure it out you got this it was in that moment he recognized that he couldn't turn to his wife in the way that he had for so many years that they were beginning the process of almost being strangers, that they weren't partners in it together. Most of all, it wanted silence. And this, I realized, was what my conversations with Krista were all leading towards. A silence that would, in the end, remain unbroken, though on this occasion, she did break it. I'm sure you'll manage somehow, was what she said. And shortly after, the conversation concluded. And that theme is then repeated towards the final end of the novel where once again we come across a very similar situation where that woman who had been mugged calls up her former husband to tell him the situation and okay i found it page 235 so then she calls up her husband her former husband and he says nothing to the situation really 
Once again, I think this individual finds themselves met with silence. He was the first person she thought to call because she still felt that they were bound together on this journey, that they were still sharing the same vision. On the phone call, he was polite, distant, and curt, while she was angry, sobbing, and hysterical. Polar opposites was the phrase that had, during those difficult moments, popped into her mind. Yeah, so I don't know if I did a good job at this. I'm going to sum it up once again because this will be a hard video to edit. The theme of marriage is touched upon greatly in this novel. To me reading this, the three ways that it came up that really stood out to me was one, to be married, to sustain that marriage, there needs to be a shared vision. Once that is broken, it's game over. Number two, through marriage, your identity starts to be formed by who you are in relation to the other. They are your reflection. Number three, when that marriage is over, you are no, this sounds like saying it like this, it sounds very obvious, but when the marriage ends, you are no longer moored to that individual. You cannot turn to them in the way that you previously had because you guys aren't partners anymore. You guys aren't in it together. There's that. Those are the themes of marriage. This book is really, it's, it's honestly just about marriage. That, that's it. That is the main point of this book. Thoughts and reflections about marriage. The other thing that I found interesting about this was the authors, the narrators. Another thought is the idea of children. So at one point, the author is, the narrator is chatting with one of her acquaintances who happens to be a famous author who has a child and describes the experience of the first way that they do is by one of the narrator's acquaintances describing how she believes that for most women the only way they ever tap into creativity is by having children by being the vessel secondly what i found interesting was how the narrator would ask primarily adult men who are divorced if they had recently visited their children and the men all seem to say no and imply that by not doing so it was better the third kind of iteration is describing how women on one hand miss their children but also when they are in their home wish to be free of them and wish for them to be out in the world and to be doing things. But once they're gone, the second they walk out through that door, they feel adrift and lost. So on page 105, after the narrator says she wasn't sure that in a marriage you could separate who you were from what you would become through the other person, she then goes on to describe how her mother once admitted that she used to be desperate for us to leave the house for school. But that once we'd gone, she had no idea what to do with herself and wished that we would come back. And she still, even now that her children were adults, would conclude our visits quite forcefully and usher us all off to our own homes, as though something terrible would have happened if we had stayed. Yet I was quite sure that she experienced the same sense of loss after we'd gone and wondered what she was looking for and why she had driven us away in order to look for it. So there's that. Those are, I guess, what you could say are the moments, the instances from this novel that really stood out to me. What, who knows what will stay, but what for the time being have managed to imprint themselves upon me. There are some other ideas and themes that the author is working with. One is, you know, what is told, what isn't told, how individuals build their identities from what is real and what isn't, what they're told, the third hand information. Um, that was an interesting phrase on um, page 156. Receiving the information of others third hand, how that can kind of seep into you. So you essentially 
hear the story of a friend's friend through your own friend, but you have no idea who this person is, how those can kind of start to form and become your own memories and ideas, even though you're so disconnected from them. And I think that is actually quite interesting because essentially what this novel is, is the author telling us the experience of others and it begs the question, will those experiences become things that we start to turn to as if they're real? There's a thought. Um, and then the other theme that is touched upon is writing. I don't necessarily have a lot to say about that because I've exhausted myself and the impressions from those moments or lines were interesting but not as compelling as I think the stuff about marriage and children, identity and experiences um, is. You know, I don't know how good of a video this is because I have been very... This is a hard book to talk about. It's definitely worth reading and I think someone had said that, or I'm repeating what Rebecca Eats books had said about someone else. Once again, an example of third-hand experiences. Um, how reading this book changed the way that they view the world. That is one of the reasons I think people read. And I don't know if this book has changed the way that I think, but I do think it is a book that is worth rereading, maybe when I'm older um, and have lived and can ex lived more and can have experienced more regrets potentially and have the ability to really like look back and reflect and wonder what was and what wasn't and what could have been. It's worth reading definitely because the prose is incredible and very interesting but it's 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 such a it's very ephemeral and dreamlike and it's hard to really grasp the story because it's just an outline. Yeah. Clever. <laughs> I don't, um, I mean, I guess now essentially the question is do I continue the rest of the trilogy? It's not the kind of thing that like demands to be finished right this very instance because you're not left on a cliffhanger, but I am planning on reading second place. That wraps up this video. It was chaotic in its own little way because I was just moving along from point to point in a very, um, in, in a stream of consciousness. That's what this video is. It's a stream of consciousness. I would absolutely love for you to tell me your thoughts about Outline. Tell me if I should continue ASAP with the trilogy. And then of course it would be great if you liked this video and subscribed. Yes. Um, okay. Let's get back to reading.